Okay, this is a brief review of set theory. Uh, set theory is a simple way of dealing with uh, random events. But let's start with a few definitions here. So a random event is, is what we're going to describe as an event that has more than one possible outcome, and ahead of time we don't know what that outcome is going to be. So some uh, definitions to go along with that, we're going to talk about the sample space. So that's going to denote the, the collection of all possible outcomes of the, of the event. So no matter what happens, it's inside this sample space. And then some subset of that sample space is what we're going to call an event. So that may or may not happen depending on the outcome of the event. Um, we'll denote that E. Uh, and then a common way we uh, visually represent these types of uh, situations is with Venn diagrams, as shown in the figure at the bottom. So the large rectangle indicates the sample space, and all possible outcomes of the event fall inside of that rectangle. And then we can have m multiple events inside of that sample space, so here denoted E1, E2, uh, etc. Okay, so just some background. Uh, uh, now we can start doing operations on those events, and there's two uh, operations we want to think about here to start. So one, we can think about a union of two events, and uh, that is the uh, combination of, of events that are contained in either E1 or E2. Um, so uh, we're going to use this open cup here to denote a union when we write things out mathematically. And graphically on this Venn diagram, if we think about the union of E1 and E2, that'll be the region shaded here in black. That's kind of all of the events that fall either inside of E1 or fall inside of E2 or fall in both. Right, so this shaded black region is going to be E1 union E2. Then we can also talk about an intersection of E1 and E2. And there's a couple ways that we write that. We'll either write it with a, a kind of the closed cup. Yeah, or we can just write E1, E2 without any uh, kind of s s uh, symbols in between the two of them. Either one of those are equivalent ways to represent um, the intersection uh, of E1 and E2, which would be the events that are in contained in both E1 and as well as it contained in E2. And so we could denote that here with this red shading. That will be this region here that falls inside of E1 and falls inside of E2. The intersection and sometimes we'll read these so again the intersection we might read it as e1 and e2 because it has to be in, in both e1 and in e2 and the union we might read it as e1 or e2 because that only has to be in one or the other okay so there's some specific special events we can think about um, using these notations so a, a certain event is an event that we know will happen that's just going to be equivalent to the sample space um, so the, the sample space represents the all possible outcomes the converse of that could be a null event. Sometimes we'll denote that with a fee. That's an event with, with no outcomes in it. Um, so we just need those kind of for some mathematical convenience sometimes. More interestingly are the, are the bottom three. So mutually exclusive events, we'll say that E1 and E2 are mutually exclusive if they have no common outcomes. So there's no outcome of this event that could be in E1 as well as in E2. So we can um, represent that mathematically by saying the intersection of E1 and E2 is the null event. Um, if E1 and E2 are mutually exclusive. Uh, collectively exhaustive events are events whose union uh, spans the sample space. So if I have E1, E2, E3, and so on up to EN, and their union is equal to the sample space, then I can say that E1 through EN are collectively exhaustive. Right, so there's no event that could happen that's not in at least one of E1 through EN. Events can be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, so that would say that the events uh, collectively span the sample space, and there's also no outcome that's in more than one of those events. So both of those things can be true simultaneously, or only one or the other can be true, or none of them can be true. Okay, and then finally we'll talk about a complementary event. So sometimes if I've got an event E1, uh, rather than defining some new event independently, I can just say, well, I'm interested in the event of all outcomes that are not in E1. And, and we will uh, denote that with an overbar on our E1. So this overbar here will say rather, you know, this is the event of everything not in E1. Okay, and then uh, that's fine for now. Okay, so all of these operations up through uh, um, this page here, right, we've only talked about events and outcomes in events. We haven't yet talked about probabilities of events. And it's fine to talk about intersections and unions and complements uh, without talking about probabilities. However, it's oftentimes we want to talk about probabilities of events. So we can um, 
start thinking about some rules for probability. Um, so things like the uh, uh, probability of any event has to be between 0 and 1. The probability of the sample space is, is 1. Uh, when we start talking about probabilities of operations on events, we can say that the probability of the E1 union E2 is equal to the probability of E1 plus the probability of E2 minus the probability of the intersection of E1 and E2. Right. We can see that quickly if we draw a Venn diagram. We have E1 and E2. So the probability of E1 would be the probability of all of those outcomes falling inside of E1. Probability of E2 would be the probability of all of the outcomes falling inside of E2. But then we can see uh, through this a little bit messy figure that we've double counted the uh, area that's in the intersection of E1 and E2 when we did that. So we want to subtract that back out to avoid the double counting. That's kind of a quick way to see that. You can show it mathematically as well. Uh, and then the probability of the complement of E1 is going to be 1 minus the probability of E1. All right. So if, and, and that's is easy to see because E1 uh, union, the complement of E1 is the sample space. So those two probabilities must add up to 1. They don't have any uh, outcomes in their intersection. So looking at this previous line, that third term would be 0 when I'm adding the, the probability of E1 union, the complement of E1. So the, the two probabilities must sum to 1. Okay, we can compute conditional probabilities. And so just a definition to get started here. Uh, the probability of E1 given E2, so I'm going to read this bar, this vertical bar here as a given. Uh, and that's going to be the probability of the event E1 given that event E2 has occurred. So we're going to assume E2 to have, have occurred and then say now what's, you know, given that information, what's the probability of E1? And so we can think about it as, as uh, essentially setting the sample space as, as outcomes in E2. So only outcomes in E2 are possible. That's our sample space, and then we want to say, well, what's the probability of some event given that sample space? Okay, so, and if we look at the picture down below, we can say, well, given E2, I know that I'm in this space here, so only outcomes in this marked circle are possible. And now, given that, what's the, pro what's the probability that that outcome inside of this circle actually falls in this shaded region here? Okay, and so we can kind of deduce graphically from that figure, you can show it more formally, that the probability of E1 given E2 is going to be the probability of falling in that shaded region. So that's going to be the probability of the intersection of E1 and E2. And then we have to renormalize, though, to say, well, the outcomes are not the, the full original sample space. The outcomes I'm considering are only the events in E2. So let's divide by the probability of E2 to take out that, um, that chance, because we've already stated as a given that E2 has happened. All right. Uh, and then uh, we can also rearrange that equation, multiplying both left and right by E2 to see that the probability of the intersection of E1 and E2 is equal to the probability of E2 times this conditional probability of E1 given E2. So we've broken the, this intersection probability apart to say, well, first let's find the probability of event E2 happening, and then condition on E2 because we've already considered the probability of that happening. Now what's the probability of E1? So that's one way we uh, use these conditional probabilities. And then there's a related property of independence here. Um, so we can say that uh, 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 events E1 and E2 are probabilistically independent if the probability of E1 given E2 is equal to the probability of E1. So the conditioning on E2 didn't change my probability of E1 occurring. That means that E1 and E2 are independent. Yeah, so, that, so I'm not updating my probabilities. All right, and then we can use the bottom equation from the previous uh, slide and substitute in this uh, top equation here. And we can get that the probability of the intersection of E1 and E2 is equal to the probability of E1 times the probability of E2. And then just to you know, highlight that, that this is true, uh, you know, if, and actually if and only if, um, E1 and E2 are independent. And then just a, a one other note, it's um, not uncommon for students to confuse independence with mutually exclusive. Um, somehow using those words colloquially, they, they kind of sound similar, but mathematically, we see that they're quite different. So uh, independence relates to these probabilities, mutually exclusive relates to um, shared outcomes between two events, um, so the two are not uh, related to each other. 
and, and uh, there's not a kind of any easing map even any mapping between the two of them so just be careful about um, thinking about those definitions. Okay so that brings us to the end of the set theory review. Hopefully that was a helpful few minutes to refresh yourself on a few basic uh, definitions and concepts.